Well, good morning. My name is Charles Powell, and I'm the director of the Elcano Royal Institute. And, and I'm very honored to have with me today my good friend and colleague, Jose Areza, who is a law professor at Esade Business School and a research fellow here at Elcano Royal Institute. And we have recently published a working paper of his with the title, A Tale of Two Cities, The Next European Utopia. And I would like to ask him a little about this essay that he's written. I'm very pleased that he's uh, made this reference to um, Dickens's no novel, whose opening lines are, I think, always relevant, particularly uh, to our current European situation. And let me remind you of what those opening lines are. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light. It was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven. We were all going direct the other way. These are ominous words, Jose. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you. They're also beautiful words. They're beautiful words. And how relevant are they to our European conundrum today? Uh, as I explained in my walking paper, what I try to do is to create a narrative about European integration as a whole. So I use the metaphor of two cities. Mm -hmm. The first city, the first utopia, has been already completed. Um, around the beginning of the 21st century, uh, all objectives uh, uh, that were put forward in the 50s as the guidelines, as the uh, telos of European integration mm -hmm. were fully achieved. Peace, shared prosperity, uh, a new discourse of civilized uh, intercourse between member states. Um, and the big challenge uh, was, and especially now in the midst of a still serious economic crisis, is how do we relaunch? How do we uh, define what is the next city, what is the next utopia? Mm -hmm. So uh, European integration has new meaning, has new objectives, and uh, in my paper I argue that we need to do so uh, urgently, but we also need to think differently about uh, the nature of European integration in the future. Let me go back to one of the issues that you discuss in the essay, which is the, the whole question of European democracy. Mm -hmm. How do we build this new European democracy? The cliché, the standard complaint is that there's no European demos, therefore um, this is traditionally regarded as an obstacle. How do we move away from that limitation? Or how do we live with it? How do we incorporate it into this new narrative? I prefer the idea of living with it. Um, I don't think we need to create an artificial European demos. It would backfire. Uh, what we need to do is to uh, make fully compatible the idea of vibrant national democracies mm -hmm. and a renewed uh, way of decision making that is more democratic at the European level. So we need to export to this European level notions of representation, of accountability, uh, of transparency that are more developed at the national level than at the European one. We don't need to uh, reinvent the wheel mm -hmm. and we don't need to think of the European Union as a future state uh, and neither uh, should we use the F word to define the European Union. Uh, it doesn't need to be a federation but mm -hmm. it has to be a more uh, representative accountable union. There are ways to do that um, without treaty reform but also uh, in the next round um, of treaty revision. And how confident are you that now that we find ourselves at the beginning of this new institutional cycle with a new commission, a new council president, etc. Is this something that's on their agenda, do you think, a new parliament as well? Are they truly, um, do you think, willing and able to come to grips with this challenge? Hard to tell because, the, as, as you well know, uh, the discussion about political union that was part mm. of the uh, redesigning of the euro has disappeared from the table. Completely. We still talk about banking union, fiscal union, economic union. There's nothing on political union. Mm -hmm. And I still think that's the key. Uh, the shift in European integration uh, needs to be uh, rather uh, serious. We need to move from an elitist project, uh, which was fully justified in terms of history, of um, also national democracy, uh, you know, creating prosperity, creating peace to a system um, in which, of course, elites are fully involved, but um, within a 
much more democratic framework. Mm -hmm. And the last years, what we have seen is a return to the old ways, to exceptional decisions by not really exceptional leaders, <laughs> but, um, but by very few leaders uh, making calls on huge uh, problems like the sustainability of our welfare state, mm. of our single currency, of uh, public policies. Uh, that is justified because of the emergency of saving the euro, mm. but we need to switch back uh, to discussion about democracy and not just trust uh, the old-fashioned elites. Mm. My concern in all of this is that now that we are gradually emerging from the economic crisis, a lot of people seem to be thinking that it's business as usual. Exactly. And of course, we can't really afford to think that way. Mm -hmm. um, how can we engage our populations, though, um, in, in helping our leaders to change their mindset? How can we mobilize public opinion in favor or in, in defense of this kind of new narrative and new vision? What can uh, we offer them ultimately? Well, the, 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 the dilemma is uh, policies are being decided at the European level, but politics uh, often do not influence the content of those policies. Mm -hmm. So we need to, to bridge that gap. Um, one of the ways to, to re-engage is to be honest uh, to populations and say to them that legitimacy by results, that enlightened despotism, is no longer going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a much more um, diverse and problematic union where there will be more often winners and losers. So we need to resort to other sources of legitimacy, not just results, but also a fair process, also building a European identity that is compatible with national identity. Um, I think the new generation has no problem feeling strongly European at the yeah. same time that they're, like myself, Basque, Spanish, you know, and agnostic about soccer. So um, <laughs> um, they're much more open to this cosmopolitan idea of multiple identities, and they don't have to choose between the national level and the European level. And we should, you know, uh, especially work with the new generations to build that uh, political discourse. One of the things you raise in your essay, um, and that has been a concern of yours for some time, is Europe's uh, inability to perform effectively as a global actor. Um, in the bad old days, in the 80s and the 90s, perhaps we could afford not to be an effective global actor, but nowadays this is suicidal. And yet again, in this uh, area, we don't seem to be making very significant progress. Uh, what what in spe specifically do you propose in your essay? to address this deficit? I try to be very realistic. I don't think we can um, envisage um, an exclusive uh, foreign and security policy at the European level um, in the medium term. What we need is to coordinate better uh, national foreign and security policies with um, a European one. Um, we also need to make sure that foreign policy is on an area that um, is outside democratic debate, is the perfect area for old-fashioned elitism, mm -hmm. um, and that will also backfire because citizens today want to understand uh, wh why uh, we need to be uh, very serious with Russia or, or what are the threats uh, in Northern Africa, and not just because experts um, make those calls. It's because uh, our way of life, our values, uh, are really uh, at risk. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have any magic formula for improvising a strong European external relations, but uh, you know we've written together about this. But uh, I totally agree that most problems uh, that we are facing as Europeans already come from outside our frontiers. Global economic governance, climate change, security, migrations. So we cannot afford not uh, to tackle them both as a global actor, but with coordination um, at national level. Mm -hmm. And how optimistic are you about uh, the European Union's chances of facing all of these very complex challenges? A, a pessimist is said to be a well-informed optimist. Are you a pessimist with regards to the EU's mid-term and long-term future? Or do you think that to some extent the process of European integration is by definition unstoppable and unbreakable? Um, I think there's nothing um, unbreakable or unstoppable, and that has been one of the problems in the past. 
to think in these terms, you know, as Joseph Weider has put it, of political messianism. Um, European integration is an act of you know, free wills, of leaders, of populations, and it should be like that. I think European integration in its first 60 years has been a historical success mm -hmm. by any measure, but it's up to us uh, how it will be in the next 60 years. And I cannot afford to be a pessimist uh, because I think Europe is the best political inventions that we have had in many centuries. Uh, European integration needs profound, uh, profound renewal uh, and the time to do it is now. Let me conclude on a more topical note. Uh, this morning we found out the, the uh, results of the uh, Scottish referen referendum on independence. What lessons do you think we Europeans should learn from this kind of um, process? Not, not just the campaign in itself, but also from the arguments that have been put forward by both sides. And how do you think um, this kind of phenomenon is affecting the European integration process? Is Europe has Europe, to some extent, um, been part of the solution, do you think? Has, has, can one interpret this result um, as an indication of the attractiveness of the European um, project? Or do you think that Europe, ironically, paradoxically, has in fact contributed uh, to heighten these internal um, pressures and tensions within complex nation states such as the British and the Spanish? As we were discussing, the European Union has lost a lot of its attractiveness, and yet from the cost-benefit analysis, um, no region uh, that aspires to become a state wants to leave the European Union. Uh, the cost uh, mm. would be too high. So the paradox in the Scottish case is that they don't want British interdependence, the nationalists, but they do want European interdependence. Mm. I think there's something, contradiction. there's something also profoundly wrong about um, not wanting to open up your identity to the possibility of a cosmopolitan um, idea of ha having several and compatible identities and wanting to be just Scott or just uh, Basque or just Catalan. Um, I think that's old fashioned, that's also dangerous and that if you've learned anything from European integration is um, this opening to the other and this compatibility between different levels of identity and different levels of governance. I'm really glad that the United Kingdom will stay together for the time being. And I think the European Union is a great argument um, to help uh, member states renew themselves and make national democracies um, is, is still uh, the best uh, possible option. Excellent. Well, thank you very much for that. And thank you. I would encourage our audience to download uh, Jose Areza's uh, recent essay, A Tale of Two Cities, The Next European Utopia, uh, at a time when I think pessimism and uh, pragmatism seem to prevail. This essay, I think, is an interesting combination of um, optimism, but well-informed optimism. Thank you very much. Thank you.